What you've just heard is a sad song. A woman is sobbing and tearful. And the man tells her he loves her anyway. Perhaps all the more so because she's sad. It was three verses taken from a much longer poem, set to music by a composer who loved the work of a major French poet, Charles Baudelaire, and fancied himself to be a bit of a poet as well. Maurice Rollinat was the 19th century version of a modern day goth someone who finds beauty in things that others find really dark. The skulls and skeletons that almost always accompany images of Rolina give you a flavour of the kind of person he was. And as well as being a poet and a composer, he also sang and played the piano, often self-accompanying as he performed. He was a bit of a celebrity at the well-frequented cabaret venues across Paris in the late 1870s and early 1880s, including the Hydropaths Club, and the rather more well-known Chat Noir Cabaret, a venue which, has la uh, which lasted until the late 1890s, but which is immortalised through the famous Tevin Steinen posters, which I'm sure you've seen. But Rollina himself is not much known today, forgotten in the mists of time, even in France, and maybe there's good reason for that. Maybe you thought the song you've just heard was maybe a bit naff. Maybe you just didn't like performance. That's OK. In many ways, I'm sorry to have started today's recital on such a sombre note, and with me singing rather than the headline act you've all come for. But there's a reason why I wanted to start with a sad song and to sing it myself, because it showcases how we can find ways to understand the songs we hear by being part of them ourselves. And it demonstrates how the kind of work we do in universities, especially in literature, modern languages and music departments, is trying to understand the very common, often universal human phenomena that still elude our grasp. Why is it that we like to sing? Why is it that sad songs have such a universal resonance? Why is it that we often don't pay that much attention to the words we hear sung? What goes on in our minds when the words aren't even in a language we speak every day? And why does it matter who sings? Why does it matter what kind of music it is and where it is performed? Well, it's that little tight ball of knotty questions that I want to spend some time exploring with you today. And it's a huge honour to do that with such a stellar pair of performers, Mary Bevan and Joseph Middleton, of whom more in just a moment. Maybe you've come, chosen to come today because you like this kind of music. Most of you, if you're regulars here at the Barber Concert Series, will be classical music fans too, like I am. What we'll hear today are all broadly classical music examples. But I'd like you to keep in mind that this kind of music is not a niche that exists on its own, but part of a continuum of our universal experience of song across all kinds of music. Now, all the words that Mary's going to sing today 
are by the 19th century French poet Baudelaire. And if you're not a French speaker, you can follow the translations in the programme booklet. Or you might prefer to just absorb the music without really knowing what the words mean. But I want us to think about how the words are more than just those of a famous French poet who died 150 years ago, because they come from a universal impetus to share human experiences. They echo the words of older generations of poets, such as the English romantics Shelley and Keats, who wrote countless odes to melancholy, as much as they also speak to the future, such as the gothic rock subculture of the 1980s, spearheaded by Robert Smith and The Cure, but influenced by Leonard Cohen, Jim Morrison and David Bowie. And why am I mentioning highbrow literary figures alongside giants of popular music? It's because they've got a lot more in common than we tend to think they do today. Someone like Baudelaire has inspired generations of musicians, songwriters and composers to use his poetic imagination as a springboard for their own creations. And it's something we've been proving in a research project that I lead here at the University of Birmingham, the Baudelaire Song Project, for which we've gathered over a thousand songs of all types of musical genre, some of which directly set Baudelaire's words in French, some which cut the text, some which use a version of a Baudelaire poem but in translation, and some which are just loosely inspired by Baudelaire's words. So we kind of have to ask ourselves, do the words really matter? Or is it enough that we just get the idea that they're sad or upbeat or tell a love story or share a memory or a hope? What we know about poetry like Baudelaire's is that it can be the inspiration which unlocks a composer's voice. And this was the idea that Joseph Middleton had when he was putting together a series of programmes for BBC Radio 3 last year around the songs of Henri Duparc which culminated in a fabulous album of songs just released this week. Now, this is the first of two plugs I'm going to do today, so we'll just do a little plug klaxon now. This album, Voyage, has 19 tracks, 14 of which are all using poems of Baudelaire's. And the idea around the programme is that Baudelaire's words, in particular, unlocked a new type of musical imagination. Composers like Duparc and Debussy weren't really writing music like this until they found Baudelaire's words. And they don't always set his words exactly. Sometimes they change words or miss out stanzas. But they are driven by Baudelaire's imagination to create worlds of song, which are pretty extraordinary. And in today's recital, we'll come across delight mixed with sadness, love tinged with gloominess, and plenty of brooding about the past. And these are the kind of ideas that, uh, from Baudelaire's poetry that a generation of composers decided to draw on in the late 19th century in Paris. These are the composers we're going to hear today. But we know that Baudelaire is other things too. He's a man about town who strolls the streets of Paris, and he's a man who hides away in his garret room to write. He's sometimes erotic and sometimes chaste. God and the devil get equal billing in his poetry. Nature and the cityscape are both part of his poetic world. In essence, Baudelaire is a poet who loves opposites. He likes collapsing them so that ideas become intermingled rather than polarised. And his famous collection of poetry makes flowers normally considered an object of beauty, either sorrowful or evil, depending on the translation of the French word mal. It's the troubled, melancholy vibe that runs so deep in the poems that creates such an emotional resonance for so many people, and which inspires this generation of composers. We might think of the songs we're hearing today as ones which are all tinged with a profound sense of wistfulness. So let's take some time to listen to two songs one by Debussy and one by Duparc. I've opted to present two which aren't necessarily the famous ones, but they're two standout tracks from the Voyage album, which you can all buy, because they have a grandeur and a creative complexity which far exceeds anything like the music that was common at the time. These are nothing like the Holina song I just sang you. Let's plunge instead into a world of luscious French melody for about 10 minutes or so to hear something that was very new in its day. And as we do so, I'm going to share a couple of illustrations of the poems by major artists who are all inspired by Baudelaire's work. So you've got the option to look at the imagery, to listen to the music, or to read the poems and translations, as you prefer. Over to you. Thank you. 
When I first came on board to work with Mary and Jo on settings of Baudelaire's poetry, we were in fact here on this very stage, working on the scores together in advance of the voyage recording, which took place about this time last year in a challengingly cold church in North London. And one of the things that became really important in our conversations was the need to break out from thinking that this kind of amazing music is something we must be completely reverential towards. It's kind of a cultural habit that's built up around classical song over the years, and it's wonderful to admire this music so much, but it also potentially closes off a whole part of the song experience, which I wanted to help Mary and Joe to unearth a bit with these Baudelaire songs. So we tried other ways of thinking about them instead. Now, I've been putting up some images that illustrate the poems in some way, just to give a different kind of visual dimension to the music. But perhaps it hasn't been particularly helpful that most of the images I've put up so far, including the one of Mary on the Voyage album cover, are often of women lounging nonchalantly on a chaise longue. <laughs> now, it seems to be one of the dominant modes in which we respond to this kind of 19th century poetry and music. And in fact, as we were workshopping, these Baudelaire songs. I remember Joe asking me the question, who was Baudelaire's woman? Who was he in love with? And my answer was a little bit inconclusive. I said, well, Baudelaire loved a number of women. He wrote about them in his poems. One of the most important one was um, his long-term mistress, Jeanne Duval, famously captured in this Manet painting from 1862. But once again, it seems to be just yet another woman lounging around. But Baudelaire also adored the salon hostess Madame Sabatier, top left, and the actress Marie Dobrin, top right. And he even used to do some doodles of women in his notebooks, which you can see at the bottom, and would sometimes send them to his friends. Put simply, he never really had a straightforward relationship history. And as I've already alluded to, he's just as likely in his poems to be writing about women as he is about other people and other ideas, many of them much more aesthetically challenging than beautiful women in pretty dresses. Now, composers from the late 19th century in France also like to set the poems that describe memories and sensations that those memories evoke, such as the painful secret you just heard of the past life in La Vie Antérieure. But Baudelaire also wrote about old men, beggars, murderers, and the devil. It's just that our classical song composers chose not to set those particular texts, even Rolina, the goth. So the group of songs we're hearing today are, are really only revealing one side of the poet's work. And if we look at when and where they were written, we can see that the draw of Baudelaire is perhaps much more about some commercial innovation as it is about promoting a particular aesthetic. So the earliest song we've got on our programme today dates from 1874, uh, with La Vie Antérieure, you've just heard. But it was not the first song that Duparc wrote. Uh, that was his most famous song, L'Invitation Voyage, which is the most recorded of all the French melodie. It was also, it was still one of the earliest Baudelaire songs, though. And the latest we're going to hear today dates from either 1890 or 1893, depending on how you count it, with Gustave Charpentier's setting of L'Invitation au Voyage, justement, which we'll hear a bit later. Now, that 20-year window was a highly productive um, time in Paris, where all five of the composers on today's programme were based. In fact, even more than that, they were all operating in a part of Paris within about a 20-minute walk radius of one another, whether they were publishing their songs at the Libéré de l'Art Indépendant next to the Opéra, like Debussy did, or studying at the Paris Conservatoire, like Charpentier, Debussy, Breville and Duparc all did, or performing at the Chat Noir Cabaret, as Debussy and Rolina did. So I should mention, by the by, that one of the roads that just cuts through those three red circles is the Rue des Martyrs, which had a very famous brasserie on it, which Baudelaire himself used to frequent in the 1860s, declaiming his poems there from time to time, sometimes standing on a table. So this was a tight-knit space where musicians, poets and artists were all circulating, some were rivals, and that's certainly true of Charpentier and Debussy, whose professional rivalry spilled over from time to time. And it may be because of professional rivalries, rivalries that so many of them started to set Baudelaire to music in such a short window of time. It was as if he'd become one of the go-to lyricists as a source of words to write a song that might become a hit, that might become something that everyone listens to. Charpentier was overt in his ambitions about this. He says as much in his letters whereas Debussy was a bit more coy, but no less commercially minded. And so it's for this reason, I think, that we get a little flurry of song settings, which use the same few texts. They're involved in a kind of artistic competition to, to see who can get the most take-up. Charpentier, de Breville, Debussy, Duparc and Rolina all set L'Invitation au Voyage or Harmonie du Soir, poems we'll hear today. And they're two poems that have become Baudelaire's most famous but they hadn't been his most famous until those composers got hold of them. 
And with this in mind, that professional proximity and the artistic rivalry, perhaps it's time now to hear two more songs. This time we're going to hear two settings of the same text, Evening Harmony. And this is a song which is not overtly about a woman, although it might be, but it's most definitely a poem which reflects on the past and explores the sensations that those memories evoke. It's a text which promotes a sense of déjà vu because it's built on a repetition of lines which reappear from one stanza to the next. And the versions I've asked Mary and Joe to perform for you today are not the famous Debussy one, but the De Breville and the Rollinat ones, because I wanted to flag up how these are a slightly different kind of music again. These are songs which might be less grand in their scope and which have much more of a cabaret feel to them. They're less demanding to listen to than the um, Debussy and Park songs performed a moment ago. And I wanted to signal these songs as part of a continuum and that a singer like Mary and Joe and a pianist like Joe, can be equally at home in both the intense Debussy's uh, as they can in the limpid Rollinas. And as you'll see from the programme booklet, the setting of Harmonie du Soir by Rollinat is much shorter than the Préville one. That's because Rollinat cut all the repetition from the poem altogether, and he just doesn't labour the point that it's a text driven by nostalgia in both its content and form. He just does it differently and much more simply. So let's tune in and hear this for ourselves.
If we've been listening to music today that has been produced by a group of Parisian composers who all knew each other, then, and they perhaps competed to produce the Baudelaire setting that everyone wanted to listen to, then we can't leave without hearing something by the composer Gustave Charpentier. Now, not only did Charpentier sport one of the most flamboyant cravats of all time, he also had major ambitions for his settings of Baudelaire. He wanted to outdo Debussy big time. Debussy had published his five Baudelaire songs in 1890 in a luxury limited edition print run. And Charpentier wanted to go on better. He decided that not only would he also go for the luxury paper, he'd also print his scores in colour, a technical innovation in its day, certainly presenting significant challenges, including financial ones. And one copy of the Charpentier colour-coded Baudelaire songs still do exist in the French National Library. It's the purple setting of La Mort des Amants. But suffice to say that that was not a particularly successful commercial enterprise, and Charpentier had to resort to the standard black and white score when the songs were eventually published. But he had another trick up his sleeve to try and make the songs more saleable. He decided to include more singers, mix, mixing a more demanding vo solo vocal line with a simpler mini chorus, so that there'd be more people involved in the making of the song. Now, in fact, it was a slightly flawed approach because more singers means more rehearsal time and potentially greater costs if you're going to use pro singers. Which may be why we hardly ever hear the Charpentier songs today, and there are no recordings of them yet. But we're going to have a little listen to one of the Charpentier songs. And to do that, I need to invite my colleague Mylène to join us. And brilliant though Mary is, she can't sing both the solo and the chorus parts at the same time. We're going to hear... Baudelaire and Charpentier take us to far-off lands as we travel in our Im imagination to another place, far beyond a concert hall here in Birmingham, because that's what songs and poems like this can do. Thank you. 
Performing like this also tells us something about the complexities of what a song is. And in the words of the famous song accompanist Graham Johnson, every song has come into being as a result of a compromise between the differing interests of words and music. And this liaison between a poet and musician is seldom conducted face to face. Indeed, it's a collaboration that often happens across the centuries. Now, the key words here are compromise and collaboration. This is what's happening every time a song is written whether or not the lyrics pre-exist. Songs are formed by a complex network of relationships between different language systems, that of words and that of music. And we're only just really beginning to scratch the surface of what's really going on within a song. Despite the fact that singing is one of the most fundamental human experiences, and despite the fact that we often associate songs with key emotions, like sad songs, such as the one I started today's lecture recital with, our understanding of the universal phenomenon of song is actually still pretty poor. Even when we say there's compromise and collaboration, we don't necessarily fully understand what that means. It can be compromise and collaboration at the point of composition or at the point of performance. And sometimes it's a combination of both aspects because song is a live performance genre that doesn't just exist on the page, whether it's scribbled lyrics or set notes or a fully edited musical score. It exists in multiple ways in the world, each time it gets sung, played and heard. What Mary and Joe have been performing for you today are new versions, fundamentally, of the songs that they've recorded on the album. But even that is a culmination of weeks of rehearsal, multiple takes and post-recording uh, post production processes, which involve many more collaborators and a few compromises along the way. And that is, of course, a positive thing. But if we're going to get any closer to understanding what's really going on in amongst all of this, we need a way to properly examine all of the inputs that go into making a song. And before we round off today, I just want to give you a flavour of what I do as a university researcher interested in songs, in how different languages impact the universality of the song experience, and in the capacity of the human voice more broadly. Now, I've developed a new model for analysing song, which uses a digital approach. It's enabling us to see a much larger quantity of data and provides much more detail than we've ever had before. I've tested the model on about 50 songs so far, so certainly not all of the Baudelaire songs we've got by any means. 
but it shows us fairly conclusively that there is no one way which is guaranteed to combine words and music successfully. Of course, all of the elements and inputs that we can examine, there are different drivers and levers, depending on who's composing the song and who performs it. And up until now, researchers have had very limited ways to factor in the live aspects of song as a performance genre. The fact that singers have to make a decision about where to breathe and how exactly they might pronounce a word. We can now examine all of that using both the score and the audio, or just one or the other, depending on what formats the song comes to us in. But crucially, we always treat it as a song, which has words and music combined together. We don't start with the text first. And we look at five different features of a song, especially where there are links between poetry and music, such as metre. But we certainly don't assume that poetic metre and musical metre are the same thing. They're decisively not, and that's important. And from that, we can generate quite a wide range of statistics, really, creating a big Excel spreadsheet, which we put up against a sanity checker, which allows us to say that just because a song is particularly high scoring in a given area, say, it might have set 100% of the poem, it doesn't automatically mean that that's of an overall net benefit to the song itself. In fact, listening to the whole poem set to music might make the song a bit dull and overlong. Did Charpentier really need to set all three verses of L'Invitation au Voyage that we just heard? Du Parc didn't, and Du Parc's is the one which became the famous one. Finally, we can then visualise our results in various different ways and put different data sets alongside one another. Here we've got a radar chart which just shows Rollinat's song setting techniques against Charpentier's, so both composers we've heard today. And it allows us to see that there's no common pattern or approach. The lines are all over the place. And despite the fact that these two composers are operating in very close proximity in Paris in the same 20-year period, Rollinat uses a lot of doubling, so the piano is always playing what the vocal line sings, where Charpentier essentially uses none. But they, at the same time, both have a similar approach to how they set the meaning of the poem. Now, no one's ever tried to do this kind of analysis before, and it's opening up a whole new way for understanding how songs work, which we can feed back into work with professional singers and um, pianists like Mary and Joan. Now, of course, there's plenty more data to be gathered and a lot more testing of the model to be done. But the scale of this research is taking us down some quite exciting paths, which means we'll soon be better placed to actually know what's going on when we write or perform a song. And if I had to set out what I think the future of song research would be, it would be this. I think we need to be much less reverent about classical song and accept that it's part of a continuum, which includes a whole range of musics. I think we need to be much less precious about how text is set to music. There are always going to be hesitations, repetitions or deviations. And we need to promote and probe that inherently universal human experience of song. The language of the words and the lyrics matters, but to varying degrees depending on the context, and working with singers is an absolute must. We need to apply the most cutting-edge techniques to song analysis that we can devise or find, and that will mean going more and more digital, but digital does not mean without human input. And finally, I think we need to improve access to song networks. There's no simple model of how words and music interact. Songs are complex and busy networks of interactions which push and pull in different directions because songs are live and lived things. Now, the observant amongst you today will have noticed earlier in the lecture recital I'd suggested there would be two plugs. And in fact, so far we've only heard one. Well, let me shamefacedly uh, sell, be self-promotional because, ladies and gentlemen, I've written a whole book about this um, which came out just last week with Oxford University Press and it explores all of this material in much more besides in much more depth and detail. And you should have a discount code uh, uh, in your flyers if you haven't got one yet, we can get one for you. But it would be unfair of me, perhaps, to end today with such an overt plug. So perhaps you'll allow me to invite Mary and Joe to give you just one last song, a little bonus track, if you like, it's the famous one. It's the one that anyone who's vaguely familiar with French classical song always knows. It's Duparc's setting of L'Invitation Voyage. And I hope this will send you off on your own journeys after this lecture recital, inspired, revived, and with all your desires fulfilled, to quote a line from Baudelaire himself.
Thank you. 